Hey there, Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Ion College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting dodo birds and leaky black. Sometimes, oh boy, we actually talk to leaky black. Matt Norland is here with me. If you watch it on YouTube, Go ahead, smash that like button like your Brandon Davis. You have consent. If you haven't yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, please knock that out while you're here. And uh, as I hope you know, the 2022-23 college basketball season, it's here. It starts Monday. Lots of games. No great games. But but all 25 ranked teams will get their seasons underway on Monday. With that in mind, we decided to, to uh, do one last preview episode to get you ready uh, for this season, and then uh, a real treat. We're going to be joined, actually joined. This is serious. We're going to be joined by Lockdown Leaky himself. The great Leaky Black will be here in a bit. Can't can't wait for that. Uh, but before that, uh, Deadleg, just to get people prepped one more time for this upcoming season, why don't you start by running folks through the CBS Sports All America teams if they missed them when they published uh, late last month. Yeah, we're going to, this is, again, the season is here. Can't, finally, right? Finally, we have games. Can't wait for it. That was a good little nugget. I didn't realize all 25 ranked teams are actually playing on Monday night. I counted. I counted. So we'll have to wait and see if if we have any uh, kind of upsets. And and First question. Oh, boy. Okay. Will any of the top 25 teams lose on Monday? All 25 are playing. Will any of them lose? Put the over under at yeah, there we go. There we go. Point five at point five. Dude, these games are rough. Horrendous. It's a real problem. Like this is you should these not start the college basketball season this way. These are rough games. Um, because they're so rough. I'm gonna say over. Give me I, I they're all at home though. Like 25, maybe one gets picked off. It's the first day of the season. It's I like guess. 25 by games. I mean, I get here's the before I'll do the all American teams in a second here. Here are the uh, here are the games to know about on Monday night. I mean, there, there's there's five notable ones, I guess. Memphis Vanderbilt is really like the only one between two power conference programs. Um, Memphis, by the way, I got this later in the show, but I'll, I'll mention now Memphis the only team at the power conference level that opens its season with two road games. They play at Vanderbilt on Monday. And then I don't know why this is. I don't know if you even realize this parish or know why this is. They don't, they don't play again for eight days. They're at St. Louis next Tuesday. They have an eight day gap. I don't quite get why that happened or what went on with the schedule there. I think, they, I think they built in a window for when the whole team pops positive again. Ah, oh, terrible. You're I'm joking. Terrible. That's not going to happen. Uh, don't worry. I'm revisiting my terrible prediction on that before that we got it here too. uh, other games of on Tuesday to know about Murray state, St. Louis, you know, St. Louis is a projected tournament team, top 30 level, potentially Murray state has Steve Prome. So, you know, not bad. Oral Roberts, St. Mary's is a game between Max Acemas, you know, could be the leading scorer in the country. Th- those teams could both be in the NCAA tournament. It's a mid major special, but so it goes George Mason plays at Auburn maybe Kim English has a team that might be like top six good in the A-10. Auburn, we'll see what they are right off the right off the bat after losing so much talent there. So maybe, maybe there's an upset special there. And then the only other one is Tulsa plays at Oregon State. The Beavers have not won in 2022. Can, can Oregon State get off the schneid and beat Tulsa in their home opener? But otherwise, there's just, yeah, it's a whole bunch of just blah on all that. And uh, maybe we can get into more of why that is on uh, on the Wednesday show, depending on if, we have enough uh, results worth talking about. I, I don't think any top 20. I just went through the schedule. I don't think any of them lose. I think they all win. Eastern at Auburn is the only one that seems halfway, halfway on the table, though, right? Uh, I mean, we'll see. <laughs> I know. Remember uh, yeah. George Mason got Mark Turgeon moved out last year. That's true. We'll see on it. Okay. Our All-America teams. Reminder. Drew Timmy, Oscar Shibway, Armando Baycott, Marcus Sesser. Jaime Hawkins is the first team. Trace Jackson Davis at Indiana. Hunter Dickinson at Michigan. Kendrick Davis at Memphis. Caleb Love at North Carolina. And Nick Smith at Arkansas. That's our second team at CBS Sports. And then our third team, All-America. Zach Eady at Purdue. Adam Flagler at Baylor. Keontae George at Baylor. Mike Miles Jr. at TCU. And Derek Lively at Duke. That is the CBS team. My team individually almost lines up perfectly first team. I just have Jackson Davis on the first team. Um... 
And then I, uh, I've i got Keontae George, second team, Dickinson, second team. I've got Ryan Kalkbrenner of Creighton on my second team. Kendrick Davis is on my second team. Derek Lively at Duke is on my second team. Uh, the first teamers are obviously obvious. And then third team, I have Zach Eady, Jaime Jaquez. I have Anthony Black of Arkansas being the better all-around freshman than his teammate Nick Smith. I think I'm on an island with that. We'll see. And then I've got Texas's Timmy Allen and North Carolina's Caleb Love on his third team. Remind the listeners of any uh, change in opinion you have or at least diverging thought from our official All-America teams. Well, I had four of the five first-team All-Americans American, exactly the same. Um, I, I also have Marcus Sasser, Drew Timmy, Armando Baycott, and Oscar Shibwe. Um, But instead of Jaime Jaquez, I've got Nick Smith at Arkansas preseason first team all-american my second team was kendrick davis keontae george Hami hotkes hunter dickinson and trace jackson davis and then my third team mike miles caleb love zach Eady, matt bradley san diego state mm -hmm. and jalen wilson at kansas that's just assuming that if if jalen wilson is kansas's best player he will probably be an all-american level guy so we're not uh, my individual ballots are not uh, our individual ballots are not too different than than the CBS Sports teams, but di but different in some places. All right, let's let's give our individual National Player of the Year picks and our one two three guys in order on our ballots. My ballot is Drew Timmy, preseason National Player of the Year, Oscar Shibway, Kentucky, Armando Baycott in the three hole uh, on my ballot. What about you? I had Oscar Shibway number one. Simply put, I think the reigning national player of the year should be the preseason national player of the year if he returns to school. Uh, although, you know, your explanation for why you didn't is simply because you think Drew Timmy will have a better season than Oscar Shibway, regardless of the fact that Oscar Shibway had a better season than Drew Timmy last season. And I, I suppose and, that's and? – and, and he's hurt. Yeah, and he's not going to – we actually have a small news bit to this uh, as we do this podcast here. John Calipari said after Kentucky's exhibition – uh, he basically all but guaranteed Oscar Shibway will not be on the floor for Kentucky C as an opener on Monday. And then he would be pretty surprised if Shibway's even available for the second game. So, you know, I just, there's a little bit of concern there. They've been coy with that. And like, is he going to be good to go for champions classic? Is he, I, I want to see a, a healthy, fully capable Oscar Shibway against Drew Timmy when they are supposed to play each other in the middle of November. So that was also like, I don't know if it broke the tie for me, GP, but like he did technically go under. It was a quick scope, but it's it's not common for that to be done so close to the season. So that was also my reasoning for why. How about, how about we could have a Champions Classic without the best player in college basketball and the best coach in college basketball? No Oscar right. Shibway, no Bill Self. That's right. That's not great. It's not inspiring, but it's we'll see. Maybe, maybe he gets back there in time. I'm just telling you, I watched that Cal clip on Thursday night and I mean, he just laid it out flatly, which I appreciate. It just it doesn't he doesn't sound encouraged by the idea that Oscar Shibway is going to be available for at least Kentucky's first two games. So my ballot, Oscar Shibway, number one, Drew Timmy, number two, Armando Baycott at number three, obviously three bigs. And that just sort of, you know, that's a storyline in the sport. You know, the best players that came back to college um, were largely uh, you know, traditional bigs. And there's a, a, a great reason for that. It's because th that is the thing. We've talked about this forever. Um, it, it, with the modern NBA, th those guys just aren't valued as prospects the way they would have been 20 years ago. And so you combine that with name, image, and likeness rights being a reality. And, you know, Oscar Shibway is the face of the Kentucky's program. Drew Timmy as the face of Gonzaga's program. Armando Baycott as the face of North Carolina's program. Um, they, they can all make a lot of money returning to school. They are making a lot of money by being in school. And they, I think, should be the three favorites heading into this season to be the national player of the year. All right, let's go national freshman of the year. One, two, three on your ballot. How do you order it out? I went Nick Smith, number one. You don't even think he's going to be the best Arkansas freshman. I, I think, think he's, yeah. I I think he's going to be the best freshman in the country. I think there's that's a very viable. Now, I said this on our Arkansas summer shoot around episode uh, when I talked with Musselman over the summer and then checked in with the staff back in early October. It was just reinforced to me that Anthony Black and what he will provide to this team as a big you know, guy in charge of running the running the point, running the offense, have a lot going through him. Uh, he might prove to be as pivotal, if not more so, than Nick Smith. They are so in on both of these guys. Um, but Musselman was just particularly saying, don't sleep on how much we are going to rely and need 
Anthony Black to be great for us. And he has a lot of encouragement with that. So the, I'm just I'm just purely looking at it from if he's really going to have his hand, the ball in his hands the most on that team and still get his shots. And maybe he averages north of five assists a game and six or seven rebounds. I could see a situation. So, yes, again, I'm on an island with that. Uh, the Nick Smith one is probably the more appropriate one. But Anthony Black's getting a lot of buzz there, too. Um, so he's on my list, but you're not done. So Nick having Smith, a difference oh, of opinion on those guys, it reminds me of the second Florida national championship team. Do you remember that little controversy when Dick Vitale was mm -mm. on radio? I don't. Oh, it's fabulous. So Dick is like having breakfast out in public, very obviously. And he's like waiting to come on live with Mike and Mike or some morning radio ESPN radio show. But I think it was Mike and Mike. And, you can sort of see how this might happen. It's like, you know, producer calls, hey, Dick, it's so-and-so with the mic, Mike. Uh, you, you, you still good to go? Yeah, of course. You know, the same phone call we all get. And then somebody walks by in this restaurant. Like, uh, he's like, sounds like he's sitting on a patio or something. Somebody walks by and is like, uh, uh, hey, Dick, blah, 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 what do you think about it? And they just start talking. And do, Dick loses track of, like, he's about to be live on the air. <laughs> so Dick Vitale's talking to somebody on the patio. Mike and Mike come out of commercial. And now we're joined by the great Dick Vitale. Dick, it's Mike and Mike. How you doing? And Dick Vitale is live on radio, but he doesn't know. Uh, I don't remember this, Parrish. He's on radio. And so you just hear in the background, Dick Vitale clearly talking to somebody else. And he's like, oh, no, I was talking to Billy Donovan uh, just yesterday. And he told me Al Horford is the much better player, way better than Joe Kim Noah. Like, it's not it's not even close. Like, Joe Kinoa gets all the attention, but Al Horford's the best player at that Florida team. And this is all live on radio. And Billy had to come out and, and talk about oh, it because oh it was like God. a it was like, I mean, how would you feel if you're Joe Kinoa and your coach is out there saying, no, oh, Noah's Noah's fine, but he's not the guy. Horford's the guy. Like, that was it. Google that. That was the thing. Our buddy Will Brinson actually has a Vital drop that he uses on uh, on the Pick 6 podcast. I now wish I had Brinson's drop for this exact. It's, it's, it's the, oh! <laughs> like I wish I had that because that is uh, that is wild. I I did not remember that being a thing or it, it just a thing. But that's uh, that is a classic there. I, to be clear, obviously, I know you're not saying this. Uh, know, was saying, saying, he wasn't saying Anthony Black's going to run away from it with Nick Smith. He was just saying, uh, don't sleep on our guy because we're going to really rely on him. So, all right. So you got Nick Smith one. Who do you got two and who you got three? Keontae George, uh, number two. Uh, he obviously is the incoming guard, fabulous player at, and prospect at, at Baylor. And then third on my ballot, I went with Derek Lively. Like he is the, I don't know about consensus, but certainly according to 24-7 Sports, the number one incoming freshman in the country. Um, I, I, you know. I just remember when we watched him, and it was a small sample size, I acknowledge, but we watched him at Peach Jam a couple of summers ago, and he was on a team with Jalen Duran, and I thought he was better than Jalen Duran then. And then Jalen Duran came to college and really had a great freshman season at, at Memphis. And so, you know, not not solely based on that, but, mm -hmm. but you know, when you take that into account and combine it with he's like the number one ranked freshman in the country – I think he's going to be very good in what will almost certainly be his one year uh, of college. Uh, Nick Smith, one, Keontae George, two, Derek Lively, three. Closer we get to opening tip here, the more excited I am about this freshman class. Guys that I don't have on my list, but I that I think will actually potentially really be uh, impactful, like uh, stat stat monsters. Once Cam Whitmore for Villanova gets in the mix, he's just expected to be. Brandon Miller at Alabama is kind of a sneaky name to keep. Hey, he's not, you know, he's a five-star prospect. Like, he's going to... He's going to be an impact player right away. And with Quinterly not back from that, that injury, I'd certainly keep an eye on him. A Dean Bono, we mentioned on about UCLA and obviously Amari Bailey. There's Woo there we go. I know I blame myself for that. Uh, Kentucky's got Livingston and Case and Wallace there. There's a lot of really good guys. You know, Gigi Jackson, South Carolina, they're not expected to be good, but we'll see what he, he is. Um, Anthony Black's three on my list. And I'd probably have Nick Smith. Honestly, I'd probably have Nick Smith for, uh, Lively is two on my list. Now, Lively is going to be interesting because, you know, Derek Whitehead, he's he's still coming back from injury and Lively as well. But they've also got Kyle Filipowski, another, you know, impact big freshman. Uh, Mark Mitchell, Tyrese Proctor have also received like a lot of really good reviews, I guess you could call it, uh, from both the Duke staff, but also, you know, NBA folks that have been in there to, to check them out there. I think Lively will wind up being... When you watch Duke, and we're talking about in the middle of February, no matter what the record is, presuming that they're you know they're a relevant team, 
I just think on a game in game out basis, I think Lively is just most likely to be the biggest difference maker because he's that good defensively. He can step out and shoot threes. He's seven one, really smart player. But I think there's a there's a real chance that what I just said will be wrong, and Whitehead winds up being the dude, right? Or Filipowski is just as impactful, or. Tyrese Proctor, you know, a 6'4 shooting guard is just an outrageously good score. And then you look up and he's the guy. So just keep an eye on Duke. There's a lot there. Keontae George is my national freshman of the year, top of my ballot. He is unafraid of the big moment, uh, composes himself well. Uh, He'll be part of a, you know, tantalizing Baylor backcourt. And I think he will learn well from LJ Cryer, Adam Flagler. And I, I, I like his chances the most at being freshman of the year because Baylor should be a top 10 team most of the season. And I would think his role will increase as the season goes along. That said, I'm picking that in part because of how good I think Baylor will be and how consistent I think George will be. I'm not convinced he'll, he'll average more than like even maybe a Brandon Miller or or Duke's highest scoring freshman, right? That might not be the case, but I think overall he's my pick for, uh, for national freshman of the year. We are not going to do national coach of the year. And the reason why is, it's just a different objective and ideal. We've done some in the past, but like, you know, what are we doing? We're trying to pick the coach that's already established and like that's going to go to the final four. Like it, just, it can be one of the coaches that we're going to have in our final four national title pick, I guess. Right. Um, so we're not doing national coach of the year. We're, we're binning. We're getting it the hell out of here. And that's not going to be uh that's not going to be part of the process there. GP has long campaign for this. And I agree with him because it's just what are you trying to? You know, what yeah, are you like like to- if I were going to do National Coach of the Year, I'd go okay. Who do I have number one? Gonzaga. Yeah. Okay, then yeah. I guess that's going to be Mark Few. It, it seems yeah. it seems uh, uh repet, repetitive. redundant. Redundant is the word yeah. I was looking for. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. So it's out. So with that, let's go, let's go, let's go. Final Four national title. Who do you have? I already know who you have. You, yeah. you're not changing, are you? You're not changing. No, I just take the top four in the top twenty-five and one. So it's Gonzaga, North Carolina, Houston, and Kentucky with my national champion being the Zags. But let me ask you this. Okay. While I was at uh, Walt Disney World on Friday night, I gather mm. that Tennessee handled Gonzaga pretty easily. Does no, that give we, we got to address that, don't we? Does that give you – does that give – Does should it give me some concern? I haven't gone back and listened, but I had a couple people uh, reach out and say – that listening to that segment when we were talking about what what happened, quote unquote, happened in the Gonzaga Tennessee game versus what actually happened made it all, <laughs> all the, that much funny. You were you were apparently you were saying something like I, I got no concerns after what I saw with Gonzaga. It's like what I expected. <laughs> it's what I expected, <laughs> <laughs> which makes me actually very. I happy. almost because uh, I think we 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 taped that on Friday and we we were we were transparent. We were taping were. this yeah. because I'm going out of town. I took my little guys to Disney World. Uh, my wife and I did. And so we we were transparent that we were taping this on Friday afternoon. Gonzaga, Tennessee are going to play on Friday night. And then we, because we do goofy stuff like this, decided to have a conversation because it wasn't going to publish till Monday. So we decided to have a conversation looking back at a game that had not been played yet, although it had been played by Monday. And we, we had it all wrong. I almost texted you guys and was like, uh, oh, yeah, should we kill that? Because nope. it, it, I know we were transparent. But and I say this as kindly as I can say it, here it comes. People are dumb and you're just going to get some people who don't understand or what what we're doing in that moment. And should we just avoid that altogether? And then I was like, you know what? I'm with my family at Disney World. I should probably just just not worry about it. And so I stopped worrying about it. But Tennessee Tennessee looked good in the Zags. Looked like they uh, just exhibition, but look like they got some things to figure out. Also, our audience is smart. We got, I don't, I don't think we got one. Oh, we, no, we, we have some dumb, we have some dumb ones. Uh, They're even in the YouTube hey. chat sometimes. Okay. Well, you know what? I, I, I mean, you listen, it. you can acknowledge we, there are some dumb listeners. They're not all dumb, but there are some. You can, you know that deep down, you know that. That's another way, way more of us than there are of them, though. Like that is even, that is 98 to two. Okay. Not even close there. We love our listeners. Tennessee looked really, really good. Not all of them. The Vols looked really good. Uh, they looked... Now, I refuse. I absolutely refuse to overreact to an exhibition game. Uh, that goes all the way back to, like... Who was it for Kentucky? Was it, like... Terrence Jones dropped, like, 55 in an exhibition game or something. Kentucky lost its mind. Um, 
So Tennessee, just I was encouraged. I wasn't discouraged by Gonzaga uh, with any of that. Uh, but they did treat it like a real game. Like they they didn't, uh, you know, if you didn't put out the uh, bench warmers until, you know, there were like four minutes to go. And then they, 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 it, they, and Tennessee shot like 74% from three-point range. That's yeah. not going to be duplicated against the power conference team in the regular season. So. They, they, and, and there have been, and I'm with you, I don't, not only do I not overreact to exhibitions, I don't even pay attention to them. Um, coaches aren't trying to win those games, or at least winning is never the priority. You yeah. know, like they're 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 exploring, and 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 playing in some time in some cases with lineup combinations they might literally never play with again. So I don't um, I'm not going to get too concerned about what happened, but you know we we can acknowledge what happened. You know, Tennessee looked like the better team in, in, in that game, but it, it should be noted. There have been great college basketball teams that have lost exhibitions to division two teams or, or to, to, to inferior teams. Like that's not a, a totally um, unique thing. And so, you know, we might find out that Gonzaga has guard problems or Gonzaga has got, you know, whatever problems as the season progresses, but I'm not going to draw any big conclusions from a 40 minute exhibition played in Frisco, Texas. I will keep the Zags number one and, 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 and keep them as my projected champion of the 2023 NCAA tournament. I don't pick my top four because uh, it just doesn't happen. The one time ever, all four one seeds have made the final four, obviously in two trivia time, 2008. Uh, we all know. I know, I know. So, uh, and the preseason top four teams have never gone on to make the final four in the history of the AP top 25. It just doesn't happen. So I get why you do it, but it doesn't happen. Now, normally I try and pick at least one team, you know, that's not in the top seven or eight to make the final four because it usually winds up happening that way. In fact, we've got a, a goodie coming up for you in just a second here. I didn't do that this year, though. I, I tried to pick the teams. I always try and pick four teams I think can actually make it, but the four teams that I wound up landing on uh, – I couldn't talk myself out of any of them in favor of anyone that I had lower than eight, nine, ten in my ranking. So I've got the number six team in my overall rankings, Baylor. I've got the Bears getting there. I've got the number seven team in my rankings, UCLA. I've got them getting there. Uh, and I have them well, losing the so. national semifinals. You have got Gonzaga beating North Carolina. I also have Gonzaga in the national championship game, but I have Gonzaga which I have third in my rankings. I have them losing in the title game two. I will go with Kentucky. I will, I will say a year after that Bill Self finally got his second national championship, John Calipari will go out and get his second one. Kentucky over Gonzaga in the national championship game. That would be a rematch. Obviously, those teams are scheduled to play later this month. And if you're curious about all this stuff, we actually have all of our final four picks went up on Friday on CBSSports.com or on your CBS Sports app. So GP will go with the Zags to get the first one. I've got the Zags making a third title game, but coming up short for a third time. So this was uh, interesting on Twitter. Uh, at HeatCheckCBB um, posted it and, and noted that every season since 2016, a team ranked 25th or lower in the preseason Ken Palm rankings has reached the final four. I'll run you through it real quickly. Back in 2016, it was Syracuse started 33rd at Ken Palm made the final four 2017. That's obviously South Carolina started the season 62nd made the final four 2018 Michigan um, started the season 32nd made the final four and Loyola Chicago 93rd to start the season made the final four 2019 Texas Tech started 25th at Ken Palm, made the final four, made the title game, made it to overtime of the title game. 2020, dumbest pandemic of my lifetime. 2021, UCLA started 29th at Ken Palm, made the final four. And then last season, North Carolina started 40th at Ken Palm and made the national championship game. So the question is simple. Which team outside of the top 25 or 25th and lower at Ken Palm is going to make the final four this season? Or – more accurately, what team ranked 25th or lower at Kim Palm do you think has the best chance to make the final four? I'm going your method here. So I kind of got a, I, I got a, I got a, a, a freebie of sorts because Illinois is 33rd at Ken Palm heading in. I've got Illinois winning the Big Ten and ninth in my overall ranking. So I'm going to take my highest ranked team that falls into this category. And that's Brad Underwood's uh, Fighting Illini, who 
probably have decent variants to them. I think that's fair to say. There's a lot of unproven elements with this team. The Big Ten I find to be completely fascinating because I just I, I can't get all in on Indiana just yet in terms of winning the, the Big Ten. So I took Illinois, and I will take the fighting Illini to get there for the first time since that would be 18 years, 05. So that's my pick. What about you? If I got to go a team 25th or lower at Ken Palm to possibly make the Final Four, uh, I'll go Texas A&M. I've got Texas A&M 19th in the top 25 and one. They're 45th mm. at, at Ken Palm. I, I just, I believe in the Aggies. I, I think Buzz Williams is going to have a breakthrough season. Uh, they were good last season, had that rough stretch in the middle of conference schedule that ultimately prevented them from making the NCAA tournament. But that was a good team to end the season. And they bring most of the relevant players from that team back. So I've got AM, some other candidates for me. Michigan's 26th at Ken Palm. I've got them in the top 25 and one. And Oregon is 29th at Ken Palm. I've got them in the top 25 and one. So if I were going to take a, a list of three, uh, Texas A&M, Michigan, Oregon. All right. Before we get to our Leaky Black interview, uh, I, we did this a, a year ago on our kind of set the table right before the season started. So I've got a, I've got a buffet of uh, predictions and goodies here. And I'm going to walk back a few things here. Remind our listeners, remind GP, GP, you're looking good in retrospect, as normally is the case here. So oh, wow. um, I think I got a dozen things to hit on. We'll go pretty quick here. Last year, idiotically, I put on the t I, I said over under 0 .5, 0 0.5 games canceled due to COVID-19. We were talking about a schedule that was lined up for about you know, 5,800 plus games. I, I took the under and we wound up losing dozens upon dozens upon dozens upon dozens of games because of the Omicron variant. Um, you took the over, rightfully. Uh, I went back and listened. You were like, if, that, if all this takes is one, then I, I got to go over. But you did also say, I don't think we're going to lose that many. That was So you were half right on that. Um, as we sit here in early November of 2022, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to say, I'm going to take the under. I please let this be correct. I'm going to say under 0 0.5 games are canceled due to COVID-19. Where are you, GP? I would need to know the testing protocols, and I, I honestly don't. I think this time last year we kind of knew what how testing was going to work. Um, I don't. Do you know how testing is going to work on campus I, this season? I, I don't know how that works. I, it, I was, I was hopefully optimistic a year ago. It is. Oh gosh, knock on all the wood. I'm going to say I'm going to take the over. I think I think, uh, I think I think I think a game will be canceled somewhere. You know, you're going to have uh, somebody get the. Uh, you know, uh, somebody get uh, sick you know, uh, mildly sick and then you test and then, and then, yeah, I think I, I there'll, there'll be an outbreak somewhere. Uh, come on, will. man. Good vibes only. I'm four COVID shots in and I got my flu shot. I'm ready to go. I take all the vaccines. Actually, reminder, I can't, I gotta, I gotta I get, can't get enough up. vaccines. I want all the vaccines. Every time I walk in, every time I go to Walgreens just to like get toothpaste and stuff, I walk to the back and I'm like, y'all got any new vaccines I can take? I want to yeah, take them all. Y'all got any more of those vaccines? Back? Got any, you got any more shots you can give me? I love get, I love getting vaccines. You're a fiend for it. I do need to get my flu shot. Thank you for reminding me. Like I got, I want to get it done soon. Um, okay, next one. Last year, I put the over under at 2.5 court storms against Duke in Coach K's final season. Duke only lost twice on the road last season. So I took the under and won because I took the under. You took the over on 2.5. They only lost twice, so I won that. Uh, they lost at Ohio State, at, which you called on the pod, and they lost at Florida State. Question for you. I'm not going to say trivia time, just a question. Did both Ohio State and Florida State fans storm the floor when they beat Duke last year? What do you think? I think – if I think I – yes? They both did. Yeah. Duke only lost twice on the road. Both times the, the court was stormed, but they did hit the under. So John Shire's first season, you know, has Duke lost some of that villain component with Coach K no longer on the bench? That's really going to be tested here, GP. Shire is a different guy. Duke has 10 road games, all of them in ACC play this season. And it's really nine that are in the equation here because Carolina is never storming the floor when it beats Duke. So I am going to set the over under this year, this season at 1.5 court storms against Duke. I'm going to go under because I know Duke is the most hated program in college basketball. Very interested to see what Leaky Black has to say about Duke when we get to uh, talk to him in just a couple minutes here. But I need to see if, the, if, if, like, if that level of hate truly transcends who is coaching the program. So I, I'm only putting it at 1.5, not knowing how good the team's going to be either. 
Do you go over under 1.5 court storms against Duke in what will be nine road games? Because, again, UNC fans are not storming the floor if they beat Duke. I'm going to go over um, just because I think Duke's going to lose more than two road games. I mean, first year coach and a bunch of freshmen like that's You're going to lose some games. You just are. And I, th- and I say that as somebody who thinks John Shire's going to be really good. I've got Duke in my preseason top 10, but they're going to lose some games. And when, yeah, Mike won't be there, but it'll still be Duke. It'll still be Duke players. People will want to storm the court uh, on, on Duke. In terms of the Duke hate factor, I think it'll still be there. I mean, people, I, I never really understand it because, like, I don't hate things. It's a weird thing about my personality. I don't hate things. Like I, 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 I like in terms of like I'm a Mets fan, but I don't hate the Braves. Like I, I wouldn't mind seeing the Phillies win the World Series. Like I like Bryce Harper. I like Kyle Schwarber. People are always like, so you must hate the Braves. I'm like, I, I think Ronald Acuna is awesome. And Spencer Strider is amazing. Like Austin Riley lives down the street from me. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't hate things. So I don't. It's always hard for me to understand. Like, why do you hate Duke or why do you hate Mike Shishetsky? But people did. They do. All right. I'm not trying to change the world here. I, I do think maybe some of that goes away to some degree over time, if only because the John Shire is hard to hate. He's a good guy. He's a nice yeah. guy. Um, like any, I don't know anybody that's gonna who that's going to be a real dynamic with Duke going forward. John Shire, uh, we'll see if he's a good head coach. I don't know, but um, he's just he's, he's a lot different from a public perception standpoint than Mike Shashevsky, and that's why I, that's why I asked GP. Like I want to see actually if it. I think I think I think people will not hate John Shire. Although there was the the anti John Shire stuff when he was a co- when, when he was a player, was also that element. There's yeah, no maybe people are gonna hate John. I, how about this? You can hate John Shire if you want to. It doesn't matter to me. But like John, just know John Shire is like legitimately like a good dude. Like yeah. if you if you knew him, you'd like him. Um, but but still, the anti Duke stuff will be there. I think the freshmen are gonna lose some games on the road, and then the court will be stormed. I'll go over one point five. Okay, will an, uh, will the last undefeated team? Fall before January 1. A year ago, I said it would happen before. I got a trivia time times two. Okay. Number one, uh-huh. was I right or wrong? Did the last undefeated team lose before January 1st, 2022? I, I think so, yeah. I was wrong. I was wrong. I need to get my own drop. I promise I'll get that in the board here in the next week. I was wrong. Trivia time again. The final two unbeaten teams fell on the same day. Can you get one of them? The day was January 11th. It was a Tuesday. Okay. Was Arizona one of them? No, but a team in Arizona's conference was one of them. A team in Arizona's conference was one of them. What? Didn't USC stay undefeated for a while? That is correct. USC was the penultimate undefeated team. It fell earlier in the day. It fell against Stanford. So technically... The last team standing. Oh, and then Auburn. Baylor. Oh, yeah. Auburn lost early. Auburn lost to UConn, if I recall. Triple That's right. Team. Yep, yep, yep. Otherwise, they were they were, they were really hot. But yeah. They were the last. They were the uh, Auburn. The thing I kept saying with Auburn was they were the uh, they're the only team in the country that hasn't lost in regulation. I remember exactly. saying that. I remember saying there that we, a million times. So you said there would be one. I say everything a million times. You said there would last longer than January 1. You were right. But you said Purdue was the most likely nominee. That did not happen when you looked at the schedule. Okay. This year, I'm going to say it happens after January 1st. What team? Well, first of all, let me bring this up. There are four teams that don't play a road game until December 31st or later. St. Mary's, but St. Mary's has Houston and San Diego State in December. They aren't road games, but that's, those are really good teams. You're losing those. Texas One of those. Tech. Texas Tech plays in Maui. If it can get, if it can win Maui, it's going to be a good candidate for this. I don't think it's going to get through Maui. And then Texas doesn't play a road game until New Year's Eve as well. All three of these teams don't play on the road until New Year's Eve. But Texas has Gonzaga, Creighton, and Illinois either on home floor or neutrals. You got to ask Texas to go three zero against those teams. That's a little bit of a tough ask here. TCU is the goes longer than any other team in the country without technically playing a road game. They play Utah at the Jazz's Arena in Salt Lake City. So it's it's it's. Very similar to Kentucky and Gonzaga and Spokane. Um, it's not technically a road game, but it, it kind of is. TCU's first roadie, true one, will be at Baylor on January 4th. TCU did this in 2017-18. It got to 12-0 and and was the last unbeaten team in the country that season before losing on December 30th. There was no unbeaten team that got to January 1 this year. Uh, on average, the last unbeaten gets to about mid to late January. 
I will take TCU. I'm not asking you to pick a team. I will take TCU to be the last unbeaten, but I'm only like 9% confident it will happen. Are you going before or after January 1? I'm going to go. There's a lot of, before you say it, let me cut you off rudely. There are a lot of really, like, look at the top, your top 20, your top 25 and 1. Uh-huh. All of those teams, be it in neutral neutral court play or their, their, just their schedule, when you, you know what's going to happen before they get into bracket play, like they're all playing really, really good opponents. That's the only reason why I bring it up because I, I, I think there's a chance I'm going to be wrong here, and we're not going to have one standing by, uh, by January one. I'm going to say, we will have an undefeated in Jan- undefeated team. We'll have one in January, and it'll be the Houston Cougars. Let's bring up Houston real quick here because I thought about them, but they they don't have they've got Maui right? Do they have Maui? No, they've got. They're at Oregon. They got Alabama. They're at Virginia. At Virginia is the one that scares me. And then they're at, they're technically at Tulsa. But if anybody's tough enough to go into Virginia and slow it down and, and just, and, and guard them the way they guard, I think I, I could see Houston winning. They've also got, no, they should win, but they've also got St. Mary's in Fort Worth. So it's possible. Houston is, is absolutely a candidate, uh, a candidate for that uh, team. Quick couple notes. Teams with the home, most home games this season. Missouri, Notre Dame, 19 apiece. Notre Dame expected to be a tournament team. Missouri is just trying to stay out of the SEC cellar. How about this? Team with the fewest one what? team. Missouri's, Missouri's got a dark horse NCAA tournament candidate. You're selling Dennis Gates a little short, I think. I am. I'm lower on Missouri than, than others, yes. I, I'm just saying it's trying to, trying to dodge being bottom three in the SEC. And if you've got 19 home games of your, what, 31 scheduled, like, you know, you're going to give yourself a chance. Team with the fewest home games, keep this in mind, given its injury issues and new coach. Only 14 home games for Villanova this season. Only 14. UNC, Michigan State, and Florida have 15 apiece, but no power conference team. And I guess no team, eh, no, that's, smaller teams will probably have fewer. No power conference team has fewer home games this season than Villanova with 14. What team has the longest home winning streak in the country, GP? What team has the longest home winning streak in the country? Yep. Gonzaga? That is correct. Gonzaga sitting at 67 consecutive home wins at the Kennel. That's no wonder favorite. John Calipari won't go there. I don't blame him. You think I'm about not it. trivia time you on this. Number two is Texas Tech with 21. How about this one, trivia time? Who has the longest road winning streak in the country? It's at eight right now. Eight road wins. Team is ranked in your top 25 and one. R- is it, is it also Gonzaga? It is not. It is not Gonzaga. It should be. This team has been talked about on this podcast in the previous five to six minutes. Houston. Give me one more guess. UMass Lowell. <laughs> that would be a first. Your Duke Blue Devils have won eight road games in a row. That's best among all power conference teams. They should have They should have made Mike Krzyzewski's final game at Cameron Indoor. Road game? They, they put it, should have called it a road game. That is, that would have been incredible if they, they didn't. Think, they, didn't if they could have only pulled that off. They didn't think it through. They did not. They, they should have not. taken Cameron Indoor, moved it, played a road game there, and then celebrated. Unbelievable. Screwed it up. You only get one shot at that. Screwed Let's it up. Let's see if you can get this number within five, north or south. Shouts to seventeen. Jennifer, no, Jennifer Rogers at the NCAA hit me back with this in September, and I haven't brought it up on a podcast. Fourteen. Uh, since. We've talked about this in the off season. Alumni who are coaching their alma maters, mm-hmm. 363 Division One teams. Let's see if you can get it within five on your first guess. How many alumni do you think are coaching their alma maters in Division One basketball, men's basketball this season? 24. Double. More than double. What? 50, 50 out of 363 teams, according to the NCAA. I'm not going to read them all, but it's uh, it's pretty impressive. Some of the more notable ones, you've got... Patrick Ewing at Georgetown, John Shire at Duke, Mike Woodson at Indiana, Kenny Payne at Louisville, Juwan Howard at Michigan. You've got, I'm rolling down the list here. A lot of these are obviously mid-majors. Jim Beheim at Syracuse, Jamie Dixon at TCU, Chris Beard at Texas, um, Bob Huggins at West Virginia. So, yeah, a lot of them are mid-majors, but yeah, 50 total. 50 total. Shouts to Danny Sprinkle, Montana State legend, coaching his alma mater. Just a little goodie for you there. Um couple more, and then we'll get the hell out of here. A year ago, I told you these double digits, these single-digit seeds from the 21 tournament would not make it in 2022. Iowa, wrong. Creighton, wrong. Missouri, nailed it. 
Colorado, nailed it. LSU, wrong. Wisconsin, wrong. I got the other three. Georgia Tech, West Virginia, Clemson. I went five for nine. Oklahoma State didn't count because it had the ban. You said LSU and West Virginia wouldn't go, so you went one for two. Hit it with – would go, sorry. LSU did go. West Virginia didn't. Here are my predictions this year. Single-digit seeds, last tournament. They're not going to dance in 2023. LSU, Murray State, Wisconsin, Colorado State, Marquette, and Seton Hall. Now, GP, there I feel like there are two or three lurking out there that were single-digit seeds last season – who will wind up failing to get back teams like, and I'm not saying that these uh, here, are the teams when I did this, that I looked, I was like, am I going to, am I going to look back and be like, I should have picked them Providence, Texas tech, Iowa, Memphis, Ohio state, Boise state, USC. Those are the ones that at least I paused on it. I simultaneously think those teams will all make the field of 68, but at the same time, it's almost like one or two might quietly wind up being destined to wind up in the NIT. Any yeah. thoughts on any other teams? Yeah. I'm just scrolling through now. Some of the obvious candidates are LSU. Uh, these are single-digit teams that will not make the tur- – single-digit seeds, last season's tournament, will not make this season's tournament. Um, uh, obviously, LSU is a candidate for that. Uh, Providence is a candidate for that. Murray State yes. is an obvious candidate for that. Wisconsin, mm-hmm. Boise State. I, 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 they were they were my 50-50. I, sa- I said Boise State's going to get back, but yes, they're my yeah. – Colorado State. I got uh, them out. Seton Hall. Got them out. Yeah. Marquette got him out. Yeah, yeah. There, there's there's quite a few of them. Yeah. The question is in those, that other group there, uh, who gets there? Uh, last one year ago, we talked about coaches in year one that were going to make the tournament at their new spot. Uh, I said I told you Chris Beard, Mark Adams, Hubert Davis, Tommy Lloyd, Drew Valentine, Mike Woodson, and Porter Moser would all do it. I was right on everyone except Porter Moser. You were correct. You said Oklahoma would not make it in year one under Porter Moser this year. I think five will do the March Tango in their new spots as head coach at new schools. Todd Golden at Florida, I think, is going to get there. Sean Miller at Xavier, I think, will get there. Kyle Neptune at Villanova. John Shire at Duke. And I'm going to say Kevin Willard at Maryland will get there. The most likely guy to do it at the mid-major level is probably Jonas Hayes at Georgia State. Sunbelt's got like 14 teams now. It's absolutely outrageous, so it's going to be a little bit tougher. But I, I would peg him as the most likely mid-major coach. Jonas Hayes helped Xavier win the NIT after they fired Travis Steele. Uh, so we'll wait and see. That's all I got, GP. I'm just I'm thrilled the, the games are finally here, and um, I'm hyped to talk to Leaky Black. So that's some predictions uh, to get you ready for the season. Now we get to the good stuff. Up next, going to be joined by LDL Lockdown Leaky. But first, a word from our partners. The UEFA Champions League on Paramount Plus. Nine months of heart stopping, hold your breath, acceleration. That's brilliant. With Mo Magic and more drama. While a former Bavarian nails the back of the net in Barcelona, an American trades his stars with zebra stripes, and a Norwegian creates sky blue spectacles. Oh, so stream every sweat, so second of regulation time, stoppage time, and extra time. Beyond magnificent. This is the best of the best of the best. This is the UEFA Champions League. Stream every match live exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. All right. As regular listeners of the Ion College Basketball Podcast know, we do not have guests on this show. It's just me and Norlander or one of our coworkers when one of us is, is unavailable. That's it. But we do not consider Leaky Black to be a guest as much as he is a part of this podcast. And we are now... Uh, lucky enough to be joined by the legend himself. We're no longer just sometimes talking about Leaky Black. We're talking with Leaky Black. Lockdown Leaky has entered the chat. Leaky Black, thank you for being here. How you doing on the verge of, of starting what, what's going to be your fifth season of college basketball for the number one team in the entire country? Man, just just blessed to be here, man. Thank you guys for having me. You know, I've heard a lot about you guys, uh, about the <laughs> podcast and what you guys have going on. I really appreciate you guys, you know, for sticking with me. So it means a lot. No, I, we appreciate that. So let, let's start there. When was the, the first time somebody said, hey, do you know these two idiots are talking about you nonstop on a podcast? When did that first come up? Man, I think I was in the tunnel during the final four. We were doing the um, before the Duke game. We were doing like interviews and one of our media guys came up to me and he like told me about like every morning. Well, like before y'all start the show, y'all like give me a shout out. And he was just saying, I forget what it was. I think it was like a mutual friend with you guys or something like that. And I like took a picture with him. But yeah, that's how I uh, got the information. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, I mentioned you guys are, 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 are number one in the preseason AP poll. This is your fifth season of college basketball. You're taking advantage of the COVID year that the NCAA offered to all student athletes. Was it a no brainer for you to come back or, or did you have to think about it at all? No, nah, it was it was a no brainer, honestly, because throughout the entire year, you know, everyone wants to be wanted, you know, and uh, throughout the entire year, Coach Davis and his wife and Big May and all the coaching staff, and, you know, everyone's like family that was just telling me, you know, how much they really wanted me to come back, how much they needed me to come back. And obviously, you know, with what I've been through in my college career, hearing that from everyone, it's like, oh, I got to come back. You know, it's just like you just it feels good to be wanted somewhere. And that's that's what persuaded my decision. Uh, speaking of that, Leaky, take us inside the team dynamic. We're gonna have some fun, and we got some some goody questions for you. But I do want to hit on a couple of uh, you know, basketball centric, team centric stuff. So almost everyone's back. You guys are preseason number one, but with you know everyone that could come back and having eligibility deciding to return, is that something? Now that you're you know four or five months, six months removed from it, Leaky, was it something that you and Caleb, Armando, RJ, like, did you talk about that a lot, you know, uh, you know, together, face-to-face, text about it, or was it something where it was more each of those guys kind of decided on their own with their families and then you didn't know, know for sure? I'm just wondering if, if maybe you had an, an, you know, an indication even, mm-hmm. you know, a few days or a week or so before it was actually publicly known how you guys were going to come back and do it together. Cause I only ask cause in with Florida, you know, Joakim Noah, this was, this was back when you were a youngster. Um, they basically got together and like, no, we, we want to do this. We got, we're going to run this back. And they, they kind of made it a collective. I wondered if you guys did it that way, or if it was more like you kind of went your own way after the final four and then convened together after you made your decisions. Well, honestly, right after the final four, I think we were like on a plane, we were getting on our plane or something like that. And, um, I think I made like a quick group chat, you know, uh, me, RJ, Caleb and uh, Armando. And I was just like, you know, we got to talk about this. Like, you know, we're going to have to figure out like what we're doing kind of thing. Uh, I don't remember the exact words, but it was something along those lines. And I think Mondo would just hit me back with like, yeah, we'll talk kind of thing. And uh, I feel like we all kind of knew, except for Caleb. I didn't know. We literally didn't know what Caleb decision was until I woke up and seen the video you know let me reintroduce myself video thing i i didn't i didn't know that that was a we were you know we were shocked we were happy to have him back obviously and um yeah caleb was the only one i think that was uh we didn't really know for sure okay well were you like were you giving him you know a little bit of grief there or were you trying you know he's trying to weigh whether or not he's you know he's gonna go be an nba pick and so you want to respect that process like you know he he viably could have been drafted into the league but you're also teammates really good friends so you say you didn't know like were you almost or anyone else on the team like you know playfully yeah. hounding him like come I was, on dude. i was nagging him every day because we still had workouts and stuff i was i would see him in a gym you know he was still working out i was still working out i was like bro Come back. Like, what are you like? What are you doing? Like, come back, bro. Like after you see how much fun we just had, like run that, run that back. And he was like, ha ha, I don't know, bro. I don't know. Da, 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 da. And eventually he made that decision. One, one more follow up on that. So when he makes the video and then you see it, like, do you give him even more crap about that? Be like, hold on a second. You had like the social media team in on this and you don't even tell me like, how do you not like give him serious grief for weeks at a time over that situation? I mean, you got to respect his the way he wanted to handle it. You know, he wanted to be like a big surprise kind of thing. And I respect it. But uh, yeah, nah, I was kind of mad. He made me wait. I mean, I go lie. I wanted to get the inside scoop before everyone else did. But it's all good. I'm just glad to have him back. You realize if he doesn't come back, that's like 20 extra shots a game you might get. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I want to I go back to last season for a moment. I was I was actually in Charleston on uh, doing sideline reporting for CBS Sports Network when you guys got pushed a little bit uh, by Charleston. I was in I was in Vegas when you guys you know got got run off the court by Kentucky. At one point, you're you're twelve and six overall. Mm-hmm. You're just four and three in the ACC, and folks were starting myself included to to question everything like what what is going on with this team and then obviously you flip it what was the key to overcoming uh, that that rough start and becoming you know literally one of the best teams in the country it's being persistent you know and trusting our work you know we put a lot of work in every day and it's like our practices are super tough some would even say tougher than the games believe it or not 
But, um, you know, just trusting our work and just believing in each other. That's the biggest thing. We, I don't think at the beginning we really believed in each other. You know, it was kind of a new group. Everything was just so new. And, um, you know, everyone would just try to be the hero instead of being able to look down the line and be like, I can trust that guy and he can trust that guy. You know, and that's what made us, you know, come together after Wake Forest and Miami when they beat the smack out of us, you know, back to back. You know, we got back into the locker room and Dewey, you know, one of our seniors, he just kept us all in the locker room. It's probably like midnight by this time. Kept us in the locker room. It was just like, we got to figure this out. You know, we had a deep conversation, an uncomfortable conversation we needed to have. And from that point on, it was Virginia Tech. And then we just started building from there. And obviously, ACC tournament was like a couple games out after that. And um, we didn't get the outcome we wanted, but we could tell we were starting to flip the script. And let's fast forward to the end. You're in the national championship game. You're up 16 points at one point on Kansas, up 15 at the half. Uh, how often do you think about that? Like, man, I'd love to play those final 20 minutes one more time because you were, uh, you know, in, in many ways uh, on the verge of being a national champion. I think about it literally every single day, huh. like literally every day. And, um, you know, is you know, something me and Mondo just, you know, we talk about it almost every day. We just kick ourselves in the foot about it just because we know – we literally know how much better we were as in that team, you know, but I mean, what happened happened. And it's like, there's no going back in time and doing it, you know, but it's just, that's, that's what makes the beauty of the season coming up so special just because we get to do it for a whole year and not just for the final four or March madness tournament, you know, with that being said, and as you, you know, are projected to be number one team in the country, uh, it's well-earned leaky. I'm sure you've been asked about this a little bit as we lead into games starting uh, upcoming here, but mm, do you feel, do you feel a sense of like significant pressure around the team that's either self-imposed or from just general college sports fans, college basketball fans, the media that has put you at number one, right? Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel that and having made the run you made to the title game doing what you did going from having that you know big time meeting in the locker room going till midnight and then you know <clears throat> winning that cameron going all the way to the title game going through that is that actually helping you mentally personally and as a team mm -hmm. prepare for whatever pressures that may or may not exist uh amongst that group right now i mean yeah um i said this in a previous interview you know we've it's cool to have the the one across our names, but at the end of the day, we've always had North Carolina on our chest. You know, we're everyone's, you know, target at the end of the day, regardless if we're ranked number one or not ranked at all, people still want to, well, that's North Carolina. I want to, you know, I want to give them my best game kind of thing. So we've always had that. We understand what comes with that. We're all amateur professionals at this point. And um, we, we really understand the game. We understand everyone's going to give us their best shot. And regardless, we're just going to take a game at a time. And uh, me personally, I don't think, there's no pressure for me because after what I went through two years ago with the, literally the, probably the, one of the worst teams in Carolina history to now being ranked on the best team, it's just, you know, my, my career is different and I don't, I feel like I've been lowest of the low and now I've felt almost the highest of the high, you know, just a half away from it. But um, yeah, I don't think it's any pressure for me personally. How do you I want to hit on that exact thing you just mentioned? How does that happen? How being on one of the worst Carolina teams, you know, in history and then doing that to growing the way you did last year? Mm -hmm. What what elements on a team mm -hmm. uh, come into play? How do attitudes change? What are the things that, you know, lead a, a, a you know, something small to grow, grow bigger and bigger? Because a lot of a lot of teams would not be capable of that. I don't know how much time you spend thinking about it, but clearly you guys were able to, to flip not just one switch, but like, you know, a half dozen, if not a dozen of them. What, what are the, uh, the factors that went into you guys changing the trajectory of the program? Right. I feel like this is the fact that we were literally, we felt like we were at rock bottom, you know, and we, we felt that. And it's just like, okay, well, there's, we can't play any worse than what we're doing. So let's just take it a game at a time. And then we just started, you know, just playing freely, I guess. And that's what kind of turned it around, you know, and then you see, this guy having fun with it. You can see the potential we really have and the the opportunity is still there for us to make it. And it's just, you know, we just got it. It's like a snowball effect. You know, Brady's in the middle of the huddle, you know, cussing everyone out. And, you know, that kind of leads to, like, just more people wanting to care. That leads to you getting that extra box out or diving on the floor. 
you know, sh people showing that they actually care, you know, will, it's like a snowball effect. And that's just, that's what it was. The, the highlights of last season, I, I think, were obviously um, the two wins over Duke. You go to Cameron Indoor, Coach K's final home game, and you win that to, I think, make – casual fans realize oh wow this North Carolina team is legit this isn't the same team we were watching in November December January then again you meet them in the final four uh, you play a role in ending Mike Krzyzewski's Hall of Fame career what was that like as a as a Carolina player to to hand Coach K two losses so deep in the season his final home loss and then mm -hmm. the final loss of his career it was beautiful you know it was beautiful <laughs> I can't I can't even put it into words you know, just because, you know, he's like one of the greatest coaches of all time. You know what? Everyone's oh, I'm a Duke fan, I'm a Duke fan, blah, blah, blah. You just get tired of hearing it. So it's just, yeah, go home. Now what? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Duke and Carolina fans obviously don't like each other. But but what about what about the players? Do you guys ever kick it together? Do you have any friends in the Duke program? I don't. <laughs> yeah, that's all I'm going to say. I don't. I do not. <laughs> I don't hang out. I live alone. Honestly, I don't. I'm, my teammates, I guess my teammates don't hang out with any of the Duke players. But me personally, I I really I live alone. I don't hang out with any of the Duke players. I don't talk to any of them. I don't. Yeah, nah, I don't do that. <laughs> I, I, that that's that's interesting there. Okay, um, so uh, so so you we, we don't talk we don't talk to any of the guys at ESPN. Yeah, same yeah, type of thing. I'm, I'm about to, ah, I can't well, but, but growing up, <laughs> growing up in is it? I want listen. And our producer lives in Charlotte. So is it Concord or Concord? It's Concord. Concord. Okay, so Concord. Gotta get with me about that too. Oh. I say Concord. Yeah, it is not Concord. It's Concord. Okay, I, listen. Want to be sure that I'm on it. So Concord. If I go there, overwhelming North Carolina. Like it's one of those things where like the state obviously belongs to UNC. Nationally, mm -hmm. Duke is as popular, if not more. But in where you grew up, like if I go to if I go to a restaurant on a Friday night and there's 80 people in there, is a situation where like. 60 are UNC fans and maybe 10 are like state and, and Duke. What's the, what's the ratio breakdown? If you go in, probably 73 of those people will be North Carolina fans. Okay. And the next seven will be, oh, I'm a Duke fan, but like not really Duke fan. They're just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, continue. <laughs> I mean, not really Duke fan. I don't know how to describe it. You know how everyone is, oh, I'm a Duke fan, but don't really know anyone out there. They're just saying they're a Duke fan just because everyone else is like, I don't know. They're just, I don't know. It's, okay. it's weird. I don't really no, know. I, I, I've got friends who are from Texas, live here in Memphis, and they're Duke fans. Yeah. Those, oh, those type of people. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know some friends back home that's just like, they say they're Duke fans, but I guarantee you he has not watched like a game. But like, he just says he's a Duke fan. But that's just, I don't know. That's just how he is. You okay. On, on that note, I, you got to pick one or the other. Uh -huh. What was more like you've had, you know, seven months to reflect. What was more satisfying or what feels more satisfying now? The win, like I was, I was, I was there at both of those games. I was in Cameron for the final Coach K home game. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we both know the week's worth of hype, right? Going into that. What was more satisfying for you to, to walk out of Cameron that night, handing him the L in his final home game or to beat Duke in the final four on the biggest stage and what was his final game and what was the first time ever between those programs ever meeting uh, in the NCAA tournament. If you had to pick one, what was actually for your soul as someone who hates Duke and plays for Carolina, which of those would you say has the narrow edge of the other as being more tough? <sighs> That's so tough. Got, I'm making you pick one. That's yeah. so tough. You'll make me pick one? I mean, one of, one of them, you know, two days later, you're losing the title game, but you still get the win. The other one, you're, you know, the regular season's over and you're walking out of their gym. He's never coaching in that building again. If you got to pick, which one would it be? Well, I could tell which one you like the most. <laughs> no, the, I, one I, I, <laughs> the one at Cameron. Just because that's his last, literally his last yeah. home game. And it's like, yeah, go home. Like, you never will play, like, play a game in here again. And, and, then, so, he yeah. had, and, then, and then he had to come back out. And talk to the crowd. How often do you guys watch that and just sort of laugh? I've never seen it. I've never seen. It. I've heard about it. I actually need. I might go. Uh, I might YouTube that after this. I, actually, <laughs> I need to see that. But yeah, I think honestly, the um, playing at Cameron, you know, his last game there, seeing all the you know former Duke guys there in the crowd, and you know they thought they were going to win that whole thing. I loved it. Yeah, I, I I think I'm with you on that, Matt. I think I like the the one at Cameron. So you are locked down leaky, as the shirts say. Um, you've spent four years playing college basketball. Who's the toughest guy you've had to guard? Who stands out to you? I mean, Paulo. Right. 
Yeah, you just got to give it to him, bro. He's like huge. He's like six, six ten, six eleven. You know, he's like super young, but he's just so like built. And it's just, I don't know. He was just, you know, he had literally no weakness. He had no weakness at all. And he was just, he was probably the toughest guy I had to guard for sure. You played three seasons for Roy Williams. You played one season for Hubert Davis. What's the biggest difference between them as coaches and in terms of their approach, how they go about doing things? Honestly, I don't think it's really much any difference besides the fact that uh, Coach Davis doesn't use cuss words and Coach Williams doesn't hold back. <laughs> I feel like that's the difference between those two. They feel they still approach the game the same way. You know, um, Coach Davis was still on Coach Williams' staff for like – however many years. So he still has his little tactics of like going about like our practice plan and like going about games and stuff. But it's just, I feel like just our offense is different. That's just pretty much it. You know, our offense, um, I'm not sure. You know, besides the fact that Coach Williams would use more cuss words than him, I don't think there's probably any difference. Okay. Does Hubert ever cuss? No, never. Yeah, he never does. That's one of his never. things. He never. He yep. seems like he he seems like a genuinely pleasant human being. Is he that way on a day to day basis? He is, and it's like you don't really know how to take it because it's like you don't really come across that too uh, like too often, you know. But um, yeah, he's he's really a genuine guy, and uh, like I said, him you know putting a little bug in my ear every like every practice last year, telling me how much he wanted me to come back. It was just like, dang. Like, yeah, I'm going to come back and play for him. Like, I'm like, regardless. This is before all the March Madness stuff. I was like, yeah, I'm coming back. So, okay. Good to know. Um, I I got some rapid fire ones coming up here, but a, a couple more just about you. You're obviously an elite defender. Uh, it's why you made our list of the top 101 players in the country. Uh, but I want take us inside a little bit about, about your craft. Aside from work ethic and dedication, everyone knows those two things go into being. A consistently great defender so get rid of those two obvious factors what are the tools or elements that you would point to that have made you one of the best overall players particularly on that end of the floor that people might not just be aware of the things that go into it that you know that create such a such a high level defender i think just my uh anticipation my iq i've always been a point guard so my iq has just been i feel like it's been like advanced for a basketball player but um, and then like my wingspan, obviously, I'm pretty sure it's like seven, three or four or whatever. But I think um, just like my anticipation, the IQ, the wingspan matched with like the physicality that I try to play with, you know, um, and it's really all just mental on that side of the ball. Honestly, you know, you, you say you're playing your little brother, you get mad at him. And like he scores on you a couple of times, you get mad at him. You're like, yeah, nah, he's not scoring anymore. You're going to get physical. You're going to do whatever it takes for him not to score again. And that's just kind of like the mindset I try to go in with, you know, just on that side of the ball. All right. Uh, let's flip it on the head. Uh, you said Paulo was the toughest player you had to defend. But what about guys that have actually either defended you personally or, or UNC? Two or three guys that you think are the best defenders in the country in your experience. And they can be active now or guys that you faced earlier in your college career. What would be some guys that spring to mind? Uh Mm, I can't give it to one guy, but I would say Virginia. Like, the entire Virginia team is just, like, they're just so disciplined. They're making, like, no mistakes on that side, you know. Especially, like, my early years coming in, like, my early college years, they, yeah, you would have, it would be, like, 20 to 30, like, in the second half, like, halfway through the second half. So, it's like, yeah, yeah those it guys, those guys are tough. Leaky, was it legitimately like stressful or maddening as a player to prep and then like go through that? Like, was it hell? Like, 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 I love being a college basketball player, but this is like, I don't like my life right now having to do this. It with sucked. Virginia. It sucked. Just because you have to slow down. It's like you have to be so disciplined the entire shot clock. Like, you have, and if you don't box out, they get the rebound the entire shot clock again. It's just, it's like, it's, it's literally annoying. All right, let's wrap the uh, let's wrap the interview with some rapid fire. Get to know leaky questions. I got some hoops questions, some non-hoops questions. I got 20 in all. So here we go. First of all, your name, your first name is Rashawn. Who calls you by that? Who does not call you by by leaky in your life? Um, my mom is my mom and my sister Mariah are the main ones that call me Rashawn. But RJ and Puff, they might throw a little Rashawn in there every now and then, but they're not allowed to call me that. <laughs> they're not allowed. What happens if they do call it? Call you that? What happens? They know what happens? I'm not allowed to speak on it, but they know what happened. Yeah. All right, fair enough. When did you actually start to be called leaky? Was that you know grade school, middle school, high school? When did that actually really catch on? Man, uh, ever since I can remember, you know, I've just been called leaky. It was times I would forget my name was really Rayshon, 
You know, I thought Leaky was like my real name. So fair enough, man. Yeah. All right, you're a well-conditioned Division One college basketball player. Do you know how fast you can run a mile? Man, Carolina Mile. I give five minutes. Pretty good. Flat. Five minutes flat. Yeah. I am interested in this. Now, you and I both know well enough that there are some workout stuff be, be in the weight room or other stuff that some guys some guys hate this way more than they hate that what's the workout routine or activity that you hate doing the most um chin-ups i hate chin-ups but like i'm so good at them but i just hate them <laughs> if, if i asked you right now chin-ups one go of it how yeah. many can you do what what's your what's your personal record oh well I, we never like rep them out like that i bet you i can do at least 20 25 I can, I can give you 20 25 right now i can give you i think i can give you three parish can you give me three i can give me- you I, like well i'm not sure i can give you one it's mental that's mental i can okay. give you one i can yeah. give you one it's mental i may need to see that next one favorite food <laughs> spot in chapel hill um man they just shut it down i gotta get a new one but it's called red bowl Okay. Yeah, Red Bull. Uh, I get sesame chicken and fried rice. I love it. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Uh, what food do you hate the most? Oh, beef stew. Mm. Um, like, ah, meatloaf. Hate meatloaf. You and me both, man. Yeah, meatloaf. hate meatloaf. Ah. Yeah. yeah, not love, there. Love yeah. meatloaf. <laughs> no. uh, we've actually had this conversation on this podcast before. I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pescatarian, so anything on that, I'm, I'm with you. Um, who's the funniest person on the team? Jalen Washington, off the top of my head. What, what makes him? What makes him? Uh, what makes him funny? Is it stuff like more like when you're away from the practice court, or you know, or is it more like he's funny no matter what environment you're in? Yeah, actually, it might be Puff, but Jalen Washington, he's just like so soft spoken and like I don't know. Is it? He's one of those ones you just get like look at him and you just start laughing. Like he's just he, I'm I'm at that point with him now. He's just so funny. I don't know what it is, but yeah. love to hear it. Uh, Play at Carolina, obviously a tremendous Jordan brand, Jordan influence. I'm wondering if you are a sneakerhead or not. How many pairs of shoes do you think you own? Uh, at least 50. Gosh, how do you yeah. determine? Like, are there some that you never wear then? Like, are there some like, I'm? these are just, they're just for show? Or do you try and rotate in all of them, you know, on a weekly, monthly basis? I literally wear my Crocs every day. Like, I don't <laughs> I wear my Crocs every single day. I don't care anymore. I'm the yeah. old head. I don't care anymore. I don't care. I don't have anyone to impress. I'm here to. Do what I gotta do. Goes to the biggest Nike school in the country and wears Crocs. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> are they Carolina? Are they Carolina blue? Or are they just like? Oh, he's he's for the video people. He's he's getting them right. Th- oh, there we okay. go. Okay, those are nice. Superman. Okay. Yeah, that's it. They, everything else fell off. I have plenty, but yeah. Okay. Every day, my go-to every day. How about that? All right, so we see we catch you walking around campus. That's what you're rocking. I promise y'all, we rocking those. Yeah. Rocking the Crocs. How about that? Uh, do you have any hidden talents, by the way? I really can draw. I really can dance. I just had a commercial come out. I'm. I really feel like I'm a great actor too. I don't know. He, he's pretty- plumbing. He's plumbing, okay. right? I mean, yeah, we just had another commercial drop last night. Oh Let's wow! Go okay. Check it out. Go check it out. Dig that, man. Yeah, and you're able to obviously have nil opportunities with that. We're wearing literally the lockdown leaky shirts. Yeah, pretty- yeah. So yeah, that's a wonderful, wonderful benefit with that. Um, Okay, would you rather spend an hour in a hot air balloon or go skydiving? You have to choose between one of the two. Skydiving. Get it over quick. I'm with you on that. GP, what would you do? Yeah, I would do neither, but if, yeah, I'm with Leaky. Like, let's just get this done. I don't need to be sitting in a balloon for an hour. Let's just get it done. I'm yeah. with you on that. Um, are you aware that, you know, the genesis of you getting a shout out at the start of uh, basically epi- uh, every episode is uh, my man GP said, you know, Leaky Black sounds like just one of the, the best stage names ever. Are you aware just how great the stage name Leaky Black is? And have you ever recorded a mixtape or at least debated internally if you should record a mixtape? No, I've never thought about that <laughs> ever. But yeah, I don't. I don't know. It's like a, I used to be embarrassed of the name, but oh, dude, you've got you've got the best name in college basketball. I appreciate that. You've got the best name. Like if you said Quavo and Offset are going to do a mixtape with Leaky Black, that like sounds right. Okay, you're right. I see. I see. I see. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. I never thought of it that way. It's beautiful, man. Uh, on that note, uh, top three to five groups, artists, bands of all time for you. What would they be? Ooh, I'm so indecisive. I'm gonna throw Rod Wave. Um, Rod Wave, 
Lil Uzi, and Lil Wayne. Okay. Yeah. No, no J. Cole local. I remember, like, I talked to Dennis Smith like five years ago, man. He was, I think he actually knows J. Cole. They're actually really, really tight. Like I've spoken yeah. to J. Cole, but I'm not that close with him. So, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, do you know the exact measurement on your wingspan? We just did this in the summer. I'm pretty sure it was about seven, two or seven, three. Seven, two, seven, three, my man. That yeah. is just outrageous. Um, what's one rule about basketball you'd actually like to see change? What's something about the game that you feel like maybe you encounter uh, relatively often that you that you wish it uh, wish it was another way? Hmm. I don't know. That's tough. Okay. Marvel movies, yes or no? Yes. Okay. What's your favorite Marvel movie? Endgame. Endgame. Okay. I can't. You know what? I might be with you on that. Yeah. I was in the theater when that, like, when the climax of that movie happened. Uh huh. What was your reaction? It, it was genuinely like goosebump inducing. And with the people there, like, that was, that was, I don't think I'd ever experienced anything in a movie theater like that before. Yeah. We were literally standing up, like, yeah. Like, when that part, the part that you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. 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 Uh, favorite Marvel superhero would be who? It was Hulk, but the past few movies, he's been letting me down. So I got to go with Spider Man. <laughs> Spider-Man. Yeah, that's a classic. My boys would completely agree with you on uh, on that entirely. Uh, would you rather swim in the ocean or build a sandcastle? I can't swim, so I'm going to uh, build a sandcastle. Ooh, okay. There we go. See, we're learning a little bit more about you day by day. All right, you were born June 14th, 1999. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, the number one movie the week you came out, the week that you came out of the womb was Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me. Leaky Black, have you ever seen that movie? Austin Powers? This, not the first one. This is the. I think this is the second one. The Spy Who Shagged Me is number two. That's the Heather Graham one. Um, no, nah, I'm not sure. It's not the one with Beyonce, is it? No, that's the third one. Nah, third one. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I've seen all of them, though. Okay. okay. All right, there we go. Just it was, it was at the time it set a box office record for I guess that uh, that uh, point in the year. All right, just a few more. More of a night owl or early bird? What are you, Leaky? Night owl, night owl for sure. You yeah, and me both. Yeah. All right. How about this one? Be honest. The day of the game. Were you more nervous before you had to play 15th seeded St. Peter's in the Elite Eight or the rematch versus Duke in the Final Four? Believe it or not, I'll have to give it to St. Peter's. Because mm -hmm. we just didn't know how they got there. You know, <laughs> it was just like you didn't know what to expect. You were like, dang, are they really like that good? Like they beat Kentucky, beat all these teams. Like, yeah, so St. Peter's. Yeah, how about that? That's not that's not so surprising. You don't you don't you don't know your enemy in that case. So uh very intriguing. All right, dogs or cats? Dogs. Hey, I'm terrified of cats. Yeah, not a cat person whatsoever. Yeah. Um, all right. How about uh, what do you think there are more of in the world, Leaky Black? Do you think there are more light bulbs or pillows in the world? Pillow. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I want GP's thoughts too. I'm mean, going light bulbs. Light bulbs. Yeah, light bulbs. Yeah, I mean you gotta have light bulbs in every room. You have to have pillows yeah. in every room. It has like, yeah, yeah, light I mean, bulbs. You think you got more light bulbs in in your house than pillows right now? No. How many pillows you got? I'm talking throw pillows, the whole deal. Yeah, I, I don't know. My whole bed is covered. I have like a king size bed. This is covered with pillows. Yeah, but you got to take into account like office buildings. You got to have uh, you, you know, restaurants. You got to have light bulbs everywhere, and you're not gonna have pillows in those places. Right. A baseball stadium. You got to have light bulbs everywhere. No pillows. That's true. Yeah. Could be true. Okay. What about this one? How about more tables or televisions in the world? Think about all the rooms that will have like 50 screens to them. There might be one or two tables in that room alone. What do you think? More tables or TVs? I still give it to tables. I think tables too. Yeah, I think tables takes that. Yeah. I think that I think TVs might be a sneaky one. Listeners, we want your feedback too. All right, a couple more and then we are out of here. What is your favorite non basketball sport to play and your favorite non basketball sport to watch? Mm, to play football. I was, I think I was a big time quarterback in high school. That's me personally. That was my opinion. I think I was a big time quarterback. Could you have played college football? If I I've never worked on it, and I right. think yes, I right. think it's good. Yeah, um, to watch probably boxing. Right Ooh, now. Yeah. GP's with you on that one. GP's in a big boxing. What is it boxing. about boxing that draws you in? I don't know. You know, um, my house we used to have a movie theater. in My house when I was younger, and we would have like these watch parties with Floyd Mayweather and that whole thing, and a lot of people would be over. You know, that was just like so fun. So I just always been into it. Okay, two more. If you didn't play at Carolina, where would you have played college basketball? Carolina. Now, come on, listen. I'm, we are you are you are on your who way. Else, who else recruited you? Who was, like, 
Who was I the committed. other finalist? I, I mean, I committed when I was like 14. So right. like, you know, it was okay. early in the process. As soon as I got the Carolina offer, it was like a month goes by. I started getting a lot of interest from like the school down the road and, you know, a couple <laughs> big schools. And, you know, it's just, I didn't care. I knew where I was going. Right. It was, it really was though. It was, it, was that a deal where like you were a good basketball player at seven, eight years old. And like at that young of an age, Leaky, you like had dreams of, of playing for North Carolina. Like, are you one of those type of stories? Um, not necessarily, man. Cause I was honestly the team down the road again. I was a, I was a fan of they, like their squad, okay. Bit, but, um, I think my dad kind of, he was a big Tar Heel fan. Yeah. He's a big Tar Heel fan, and I just kind of – I knew I fit better in Carolina system than I would have over there. So Okay. Last one. Why do you wear number one for your uniform? Uh, When I was younger, my grandma would always tell me I was always number one. You know, she was, yeah, number one, yeah, number one. And, you know, every time I see her, she was just – I don't know. So it's just that's just the number that, you know, I've always would wear if I could get it. And as part of it's, you know, uh, an homage to her, your grandmother as well. Is that fair to say? Mm hmm Yeah. Pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Dig it, man. Leaky Black, thank you for joining us on the Ion College Basketball Podcast. GP, take it away. Dude, uh, thank you for being here. We know you're busy this time of the year. I, I can't uh, uh, say uh, thank you enough for, for taking some time with us. And uh, go have a great uh, final season of college basketball. Maybe we'll see you at the Final Four again. Yes, sir. Appreciate you guys for having me. Should we, right. Hold on. Before you wrap this, GP. Do, if they make another run, do we want to maybe we'll see? We we'll actually know, and Leak, you and I met at the final four. Like, we I knew that was you, I, I, I knew that was, was you. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I knew that was no, we're good, we're good. So, we tried to make it, uh, you know, a, a three way meetup. Maybe we do it in this, in this regard again. If they make another final four run, maybe we try it's final four is super, super, super busy. But if you get there, nah. maybe we put a bow on it, we come back around and let's we do have it. Let's do it. Let's go ahead, and book it. let's go ahead and book it. Today. The great Leaky yep. Black. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Concord, North Carolina. Shouts to Hunt Larnell. And shouts to Lockdown Leaky. Thank you guys once again for listening to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify over at Apple. Leave a nice review, five stars, type some words. There's more of us than there are of them. And if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, please knock that out. Enjoy the start of the 2022-23 college basketball season. We're going to talk to you again real soon. Till then, take care.